So now we go to installing the base system. So we need to get some information from resolve.conf and put it into the new environment. However, this tends to not put the correct values in that I would use. So I'm going to modify that. Uh, yeah, I'll add in um, the main mynet.org and name server is that one. So now we need to mount some necessary file systems. So there's all these here. Oh, but if we're, so if we hadn't used Gen 2's install media, we'd have to run all of these commands individually. These are all the virtual file systems that we need to make available in the Truit environment. And it says this step can be replaced with simply archroot forward slash MNT Gen 2. So let's have a go at that. And it looks like it's truted as in straight away. Indeed it has. So if you're not using Gen 2 live install, you'll need to do these commands here. Possibly do these commands as well. And then run these commands here. The only thing we probably need to do now is maybe this. And it might be a good idea to do this to remind us we're in a true environment just by modifying the prompt. And it says if the Gen 2 installation is interrupted anywhere after this point, it should be possible to resume the installation at this step. There's no need to repartition the disk again. Just mount the root partition, run the steps above with copying DNS info to into the work environment. This would also be useful for fixing bootloader issues. More information can be found in the Truth article. Preparing for the bootloader. So now that the new environment has been entered, it's necessary to prepare the new environment for the bootloader. <coughs> it will be important to have a correct partition mounted when it's time to install the bootloader. For UEFI systems, dev SDA1, or in our case, NVMe, uh, 0N1 was formatted with the FAT32 file system and will be used as the EFI system. Create the new EFI, EFI directory if not yet created. I think we created it. Yep, we did. And mount that partition onto EFI. So we want to mount NVMe N0 P1 is it? No. N1 P1. Always forget the second one. NVMe0 N1 P1. To EFI, that's better. So now if we do a DF minus H, we can see that one gigabyte partition has been mounted and we can look at it and see, uh, sorry, not that one, EFI, there's nothing in it. So the next step is to install a snapshot of the Gen2 build repository. A snapshot contains a collection of files. Okay, you can use this if you want to. I have used it in the past. Um, it's not absolutely necessary though. I have found that even though I use that um, updating, it's not always up to date. So it might be best to just carry on down here unless you do need to run it as it says if you're behind a firewall optional setting mirrors definitely recommend doing this 
So what this is doing is um, oh yes, yeah, we're in the environment now. Let me yeah, let's do this. We can do what I've just remembered, which was about the CPU information for configuring where was it down here Oh yeah, it's one of these, isn't it? I've already closed them down. Right, yeah, as this Resolve Marsh wanted to try out. Okay, so what this does is import a or merge a program called Mirror Select, and it says right repos call this little tree says the directory. Your current profile is invalid if you just change your profile okay so this is the thing with the gen 2 manual there's always little niggles it's not perfect um, okay so the web r sync does actually it could actually be up to 24 hours old. That's probably why when I run the sync myself, it does tend to update it a little bit. Um. Sure, they've changed this a bit. This mirror select here it used to be. No, it isn't. Okay, looks like what I have to do is to run that web R sync and hopefully it will set everything up that's missing. Okay, that was quick. I thought it would be. Right, so now we should be able to run this command here to get this mirror select program. Yeah, it's working now. And what it's going to do is download these packages. They're new. That in there, it will compile them and install them. So these are our first, first programs we're compiling.
Okay, that's done. So now we can run this mirror select program, which will ask us where we would like our local mirrors to be to download packages. So what I tend to do is just look for some countries nearby. I tend to use Germany, reasonably close by. Uh, France should be good. You might find some of these don't work, in which case you can remove them. Uh, a later point. Denmark, I guess, is reasonably close. Uh, Germany. Lots of Germany. Greece, uh, Ireland, Netherlands, yeah, that's not too bad, I guess. And UK, where I'm based. Hit enter for OK. And what's happened now is that we've had all those URLs added into our um, make.conf. And you'll see they're there. And they've actually listed them out quite nice and neatly now, so it's easier to edit them rather than one long uh, line. And they're even highlighted. Oh, I see it's the rsync and FTP. So the web ones are in blue, and the network ones, like FTP and rsync, are in white. So that's quite easy to read. So it could be you might prefer one over the other. It's possible to update the Gen2 eBuild repository to the latest version. It's definitely not sure. I suppose there's a need for the latest packages. So we can run Emerge Sync. And I'll just update anything. Uh, yeah, at one point, thing noted there, it says there. Common Gen 2 netiquette says that you should not sync more than once a day. Excessive requests may lead to automatic temporary bans on rsync Gen 2 org service. So it's generally, as it says there, not recommended. You shouldn't need to do it more than once a day anyway. Um, unless, of course, there's maybe a fault. But even then, you, you probably don't want to hit all these servers all the time. And so that's update. So that's bang up to date now. Um... When Gen 2 eBuild repository is synchronized, Portage may output information messages into the following. So, yes, we've got 15 new news items. We can do eSelect news list, and that shows you the headers for all of the news items. And if you typed in eSelect news read, it would read all of them and just scroll them off the screen. So what I'm going to do is to read the ones I know that I don't need to worry or do anything about because I uh, currently maintain several Gen 2 boxes. I recognize them. Uh, well, let me read the first one because I don't, need, don't know. I don't need to worry about that. If I uh, type this news read one, you can see it's put the newsletter out for that particular one. And what will happen now that I've read that is that it changes it to have been read and I can do eselect news unread one and it will change it back to blue 
and put the end back here as if it had never been read. So I'm just going to read all of these quickly, the titles. I think I can get rid of all of these. Apart from 14, let me just read 14. And this is because I do configure and compile my own kernel. Right, I need to do this then because I'm going to be compiling my own kernel. When we come to do the kernel, I'll show you that you can use pre-built ones. You can use a script or um, you can follow me doing a, a um, manual, manually built kernel. Let's put that in to make sure that gets put in. Okay, that wasn't there before, so it may even be mentioned in the manual about that. So I think, oh, let's read 14 as well. But grub, right? Okay, I think we can accept that at the moment. Yeah, I think I can read them all. So that's just read all of them, I just all scrolled off the screen. So I won't get that niggling command, except for if any new ones appear through installing new packages which is going to happen and some more information about it there so choosing the right profile e-select profile list see what profiles available and the current one in use is this one here with the star next to it so it's no multi-lib stable it's not a desktop version, it's not hardened, it's not anything else. Um, so it allows me to have total control about over how I install the system. So I don't need to make any changes. And also worth noting, it's a, it's not a system D one. The system D ones are in a subdirectory called system D the equivalent. So I know it's an open RC one because it doesn't mention system D. Adding a bin package host, a binary package host. Since December 2023, Gen2's release and engineering team has offered the official binary package host, colloquially shortened as the bin host, for general community to retrieve and install binary packages. Adding a binary package host allows Portage to install cryptographically signed compiled packages. In many cases, adding a binary package will greatly decrease the mean time to package installation and adds much benefit running Gen2 and older, slow, or low power systems. So it mentions how to do that. I won't be doing that because to me, this is all about uh, compiling your own stuff. But if you do want to um, do that, uh, then the information is there. Uh, don't need to look at that at all. 
Oh, it's that one. Yeah, so there's some tweaking and uh, configuration required to get that to, to work. And configuring the use variable, yes. Yeah, so this is the bit that I actually run a command here to find out what the current use variables are. So, yeah, that, that looks a bit more like what I expected to see. So there's a few options there, and the LTO one is there, which is what I'd set. That's why I wondered what was happening before, because LTO wasn't in the one that I'd created or viewed earlier. So let's go back here. And I'll paste that in, just purely for my reference. Uh, take off the LTO. So some of these you don't want to touch. Others, such as IPv6, because I don't use that, I'm going to remove that by typing in minus IPv6. And all this is is a list of words separated by spaces. Um, if you keep them in alphabetical order, it's easy, easy to manage, a bit like it's responded to them in alphabetical order. Um, there's probably a few others I'll be setting. Uh, but generally, some of these you don't want to touch, like PAM, um, Zlib you probably don't want to touch, SSL you probably don't want to touch, Readline, AMD64, um, you don't want to touch either. Um, but I'll be taking that off. Another one I take off is PPP and DHCPD, I think it is. DHCPD. Um, PPP is something to do with point-to-point -point protocol for modems, I think, and DHCPD. I use static addressing, so I don't want the DHCP daemon or uh, any tools running at all. So now if I save that and rerun that command, you'll see that P well, PPP wasn't there to start off with, but IPv6 is not there now because I've explicitly told it that I don't want that. And as we go along, um, yeah, it, as it says there, it will get much, much larger the more, more you add to it. And there's a file there with a full description of all of the um, flags that can be added to make config. And these are the global variables. That affect more than one package but most packages have individual variables that affect just that package and as it says there uh, um, when a use variable is defined it's added to the use list and when it's prefixed by minus sign it's removed from the list so for example to disable support for graphical environments minus x can be set it does say you can set minus star, which will disable everything except for the ones that's defined in make.conf. It's just strongly discouraged, and I must admit, I've never needed that at all. CPU flags. Uh, we've seen this. Um, CPU flags underscore x86. We've already set it um, there. And as it says there, the underscore x86 is common to AMD64 and x86, i.e. 64-bit and 32-bit. There is the, there is used to, this is used to configure the build to compile a specific assembly code or other intrinsics, usually handwritten or otherwise extra, and it's not the same as asking the compiler to output optimized code for a certain feature, easy march. Users should set this variable in addition to configuring their common flags as desired. All right, so is that saying? Does that mean that's saying to 
See, at one time, all these used to be in common for, or C flags with a minus M in front of them. Then this appeared, and I stopped doing that and put them in CPU flags, and that's appearing. Specific assembly code, rather intrinsic. It's not the same as the output optimized code for certain CPU features. Yeah, I'm not sure if they do need to be put there in there or not. Again, maybe that's something to investigate. Um, CPU ID to CPU flags. We've already run this. It doesn't exist at the moment. There's no harm in emerging it and having it available. As you can see, it's the same output as it was before. They actually put them into package.use for the looks of it. So this echo command uses a different format. So it's basically saying for everything, uh, make that available. We've put it in make.conf, so a slightly different place, but it should have the same effect. Um, I don't like to use the package.use um, for adjusting packages. I like to use a single file where everything is. You can see everything at once. Um, so we'll, well, let's have a quick look at it now. So yeah, they've got and separate directories for accept keywords and mask and use. Um, yeah, there's nothing in there. I'm actually going to get rid of these. Uh, if you want to use them, that's up to you. But I think the way I do it is a lot easier to manage. But that's just personal preference. So the next thing we've got here to set is video cards. Should be configured appropriately depending on available GPUs. It's not required for a console only install. So we don't need to set it at the moment because we're not doing a graphical install. We won't be boosting the graphical install. We'll be doing that later. Um, so I'll ignore that. The accept license variable. This is because certain bits of software need licenses and you're basically saying, yes, I accept this license. Uh, so what we're doing is using another configuration file called package.license uh, let's run this oh not in there though So everything that's free, but if we get stuff that might not be free, has a license, a different type of license, then we can explicitly edit those. And again, they're using a directory to modify this. Uh, the thing is, with it all in one file, you can see exactly everything all at once. Otherwise, if you've got individual files, you've got to open each individual file to check things. Or if you want to modify um, a particular flag that's common to several packages, but it's not a global flag, we don't want to set it globally. Uh, it could be more work. So some examples there, which we probably will be coming to and using. So now we're going to update the world set. The world set is the list of packages that we've chosen to install. And what this does is it will update these packages by recompiling them either by uh, latest versions being installed or some flags that we've changed. You can see some flags here have changed in the green. So they're obviously different from the default when the system was the Catalyst system created this uh, initial environment. And as you can see there, IPv6 has been removed because I've told it to remove it. And you can see. Uh, 
the CPU flags have been set here as well. Uh, they've been recognized by libgcrypt there. Uh, LTO, so GCC is going to be recompiled with LTO enabled. And there's some other CPU flags there and some other options. Another one there without IPv6, looks like DHCPCD, that may be. I need to set, let me do no there. DHCP CD, let's see if I might have set that wrong. Rerun that command. So that had 20 packages to update. I still got 20 car. Okay, there might be something I need to delete then. So what I'm going to do is to let that run. In fact, what I might do is to emerge that clean and this will Right, mirror select is being deleted because it wasn't set to remain. Um, yeah, I'll agree CPU ID to CPU flags. You're only going to need once. That's all right. Next select. Um, don't think we'll need that. So it looks like these can be removed. So I'll let them get cleaned up. Um, yeah, the book says to use pretend is probably a safer thing to do. Had I press enter there accidentally, it would have gone ahead and deleted them. So pretend is probably a safe thing to do. Um, the A is ask, minus P is the same as pretend. So it just does the thing without even asking. Um, but with the minus A, it would ask and had I press enter or type yes, it would have deleted them. So I'm going to let this run. It's going to take probably a while because Gen, uh, GCC is going to be recompiled and that is a big package to compile. So I'll let that run and then come back. Right, so that's finished updating. So the next thing to do is to check the messages, see if there's anything here. So suggest to reboot the system because Pam has been updated, but we can't do that because we're in a root at the moment. Um, and for DHCP CD, which I'm going to get rid of, it says about installing something extra. And it reminds us that after an update to run the merge step clean so this is actually the next command to run I wouldn't expect anything to come out no there's nothing um, if we look we can see what's in the world file uh, with cat far um, zip loop portage world this is just a plain text file it shows what's in there so uh, the fact that DHCPD is still in there and hasn't come out shows that it's part of the actual profile so I'm just going to have to force it out with emerge step clean DHCP CD and to ask me selected for removal okay let me copy this instead uh, right without the version number 
So what that means is there's something pulling that in and it's net IRFC. So if we emerge net IRFC, IFRC, Oh right, it's DHCP is the use flag that I want to set, so that's why it hasn't been removed. So DHCP, not DHCPD or DHPCD, whatever I put in, that's all it's required. That's what I want to get rid of it. So now if I do another update command, which is that one there, not only should I see net IRFC change which it has done because I've altered that but when I do a depth clean the HCP CD should come out as well because there's no reference to it it's dangling basically so it should come out so that's been updated it's been told it doesn't need the HCP CD anymore or DHCP so emerge step clean and ask and there you see it's identified the HCPC as not being called on by anything. It's not required, so now it can be removed. And that's done. So this bit's about using System D as a system service manager. So I'll skip that bit. like the remainder of the handbook will provide system D steps alongside OpenRC Oh, right, okay. So it's saying that it's going to intermingle the OpenRC along with the system D. So we need to do these things. So we can look to see what time zones there are on the machine to set that up. And um, just look for the continent you're in. So I'm in Europe. And then look for a town or city that you're in. So I'm in London. And then that information can be set in the ETC time zone. So I just need to change this to London. Finally, the Syslibs time zone data package, package can be re reconfigured up to in ETC local time based on the ETC time zone entry. So we'll merge that. That's done. It says found a regular file at ETC local time. Software may expect a symlink instead. You may convert it to symlink by removing the file and running that command there. So let's. Let's just have a look inside that one. Okay, so it's a binary file, so let's remove that. And then it says to basically rerun the command we just ran. And that's it. So linking user shares only for Europe London at ETC local time. And that should be done. System D, you do something different. Locale generation. Supported system locales must be defined in ETC locale.gen. So let's edit that. And there's some examples there to get an idea of what you can put in. So I'm just going to add in 
en underscore gb dot uh, sorry space iso dash eight eight five nine dash one and en underscore gb dot utf dash eight space utf dash eight i've just basically copied the us ones but change the country to gb save that then run locale dot oh yes it says most applications need or many applications need a utf8 locale to build correctly so I just run this to generate the locales that's done it verify they're available with locale minus a yep they are there's the two there that were just added once it's done you can now select the system wide locale so let's see what the system knows about and you can see it's got the ones we've added in so to set the one that I want is set and then the number next to it on to use five and tells me I need to update the profile so that the environment knows about it and then list it again you can see that it's been confirmed that that's what's set and in fact it's got more comprehensive command there to reload the environment and that's done.